Thank you for watching the Housing Oregon YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe. Uh, slide decks from the presenters are going to be available below. Uh, thanks for watching. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the session about uh, acquisition of market rate housing. So if you're still looking what session you are, you're in the right one. Um, we have, um, we'll, we'll get us started pretty soon, but we've got a, a, a group of uh, great uh, panelists here that will share some of the, uh, I would say, the early learnings of this uh, undertaking, uh, both from the state and the city of Portland, and some of our partner, developing partners that have, <clears throat> that have uh, decided to go down this, time, this type of uh, uh, investment as well. Uh, I'm Roberto Franco. I'm the Deputy Director of Development at Oregon Housing Community Services. Uh, that's the whole team that provides the finance and the resources. Uh, that's where the applications team, uh, the technical advisors, and all of our production analysts uh, were all part of the, the development uh, team or teams. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the topic. The uh, I think the, the behind the, the topic is really this, this whole idea that we have to look at every toolbox that we can have in order to uh, not only maintain, but also increase in the production of uh, affordable housing, bring them into the, uh, into the portfolio of affordable housing. Um, I guess we don't have a lot of time to waste, meaning uh, building housing takes long, uh, it takes a different kind of financing. So I think the, uh, the opportunity for market rate housing is a good one. And hopefully we're not too late uh, for, for that game. But um, so that, that's the focus of today is from the state's perspective, the city, uh, Portland, city of Portland's perspective and, and some of the developers. And so the way that we would like to do this is um, each of the panelists um, will we'll take some time uh, and they'll do a lot more better introduction of themselves, the work that they do, and the role in this uh, undertaking of acquisition of market rate housing. And so each of them will take some time in doing that. Um, then I'll introduce some topics or conversations to get us started. And then as they talk, as they share what they're doing, what they're learning, you can also think of questions that you would like to ask uh, towards more or less towards the end of the session. So if that works, um, so I, I'll just pass it right on and we'll, we'll get started. Any questions before we get started? I wasn't, anyway, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Carmel. I am the Lyft Program Manager for Oregon Housing and Community Services. Uh, Lyft is a funding source uh, that is in the affordable rental housing side. And I'm going to take a step down memory lane that uh, it was created from the selling of Article 11 coupons. Um, who is here when Lyft originated as an innovative source for funding? Um, so the, the, the name implies local innovative fast track housing. Um, I'm going to leave it at the name, but uh, for those of you that have worked with multiple different funding sources, um, just know that, you know, one particular source is not a silver bullet for solving certain things, even if you're working with federal funds. Um, all of them have restrictions and all of them have very unique attributes of, of what they are. So uh, a little bit about Lyft itself. Um, so Lyft was created to increase the supply of net new housing units that are at or below 60% of area median income. So Lyft acquisition is a new utilization of Lyft. Um, and so it's the acquisition of like new properties. And what this means is a property that has been placed in service recently uh, through certificate of occupancy or um, within the last seven years. Um, and what they're looking at specifically are these are projects that require no major renovations. So this can include major systems, envelopes, roofing, replacement of finishes, or elevators. Um, 
as mentioned earlier, uh, rental lift serves a population that is at or below 60% of area median income. Um, and lift acquisition works, if you've used lift uh, before for a new construction project, uh, lift acquisition works a little bit differently than other traditional funding sources that OHCS, when you apply for, are ready right when you're ready to acquire the property. So there are potential situations where it, it's the 60% the of AMI is really important to pay attention to here. And as the source itself works, if you're acquiring a, a building that is occupied by tenants, the amount of lift that you can draw down, and this is the, the part of lift that makes it lift, um, is that you have to, you can only draw down a portion of funding that's a percentage of the percentage of the population in that building that, are, that meet 60% of AMI. So you have three years to actually be able to uh, move new tenants in that meet that income restriction, but just be aware of the, the limitations of, of how it's being utilized. Um, and there is a 30 year affordability period um, and it is structured just the same as Lyft would be on a different project. It's loaned to zero percent interest uh, and deferred payments through the affordability period. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right there um, and pass it along. Thank you, Garrick. Um, so my name is Danelle Norby, and I am a manager at the housing Portland Housing Bureau. I support our housing investments team. And first, I just want to talk a little bit about why PHB is interested in an acquisition strategy. Um, so I stepped into a management role early this year. And from the moment I was in that role, I had brokers calling me. Um, and the message that they were carrying was, um, this is a unique time in the market. There are opportunities out there. Buildings are trading for below their replacement value, significantly less than the cost of new construction and this window will not last forever. Uh, the market will correct, interest rates will come down, you should jump on it. And so, no offense to the brokers in the room, but you shouldn't, probably shouldn't just trust brokers, uh, you know, <laughs> without, <laughs> you shouldn't just trust everything they say. But I soon heard this message from our development partners as well. Um, and so PHB really started to listen to this. Um, and the second reason we became interested, and this is really related to that first, uh, that first reason of there being unique opportunities. Um, this is a, an opportunity to leverage the limited resources that the Housing Bureau has. Uh, the Portland bond, which has been very successful in delivering new affordable construction, is now fully committed. We have less than 20 million of our Metro bond resource um, that remains unallocated. And I think these numbers speak for themselves. I do wanna say these are rough estimates. We're in the process of updating our data on average new construction cost uh, for our recent and our upcoming closings. Um, but what we are seeing is the potential to acquire new construction pre-TCO projects for a total cost, including acquisition and soft costs of 100 to 150,000 less than our average new construction cost. And we're seeing for occupied buildings, a total cost, including acquisition, minor renovation, and soft costs of around 250 to 300,000 per unit below our average new construction cost. Again, rough numbers, so please don't put those in print, but gives you a sense. And then the third reason is really just the delivery timeline. So obviously new construction, you're looking at a pre-development timeline of two years, maybe more. Many prog projects in Oregon are um, competing for and relying on those 4% um, tax credits, which are now competitive. And so we really saw this as a way to, deli to deliver affordable units quickly within months instead of years. PHB has now had um, two offerings for acquisition. We had the spring last gap NOFA, where we made funds available for new construction and acquisition for projects that were ready to proceed to closing by the end of 2025. And we identified one acquisition project through that NOFA. And Nikolai is going to speak a little bit more about that later, so I'll, I'll leave it to him. And then this summer, we started talking to OHGS about whether it would make sense for PHB to put some more funds out for acquisition to pair with Lyft, because we heard about the opportunity. Um, we knew that we needed to adjust our process somewhat 
to be more nimble, to make a lane really that was just for acquisition, where we could move quickly and make decisions quickly. So in early September, we released our rapid acquisition RFP. It's actually open through October 7th. Um, and we, this is kind of unusual for us, but we did a rolling application basis. Um, our maximum subsidy is 100,000 per unit. That's compared to our PHP's typical max subsidy of 150,000 per unit. Units must be in ready to occupy condition. We would allow minor renovation for the purpose of converting um, spaces to tenant supportive spaces, for example. Um, and we had a goal of getting some units at or below 50% AMI. So our bond funds have created a lot of units at 60%. We are hearing that that's actually very close to market in many parts of Portland. So we had a goal to kind of get those unsubsidized 50% units if possible. So we are in the process of reviewing the first applications that have come in through this RFP, and we hope to make some decisions very quickly and get those, um, get those projects moving. Um, just a couple of sort of challenges and considerations I'll touch on, although I think we might get into this more in the questions, but um, timing of due diligence items. So in a perfect world, like we would be able to review all the third party reports before we make a funding decision. Um, but in the sort of rapid acquisition track we're on, we can't always have a recent capital needs assessment, for example. So what we decided is that we would do kind of a soft commitment. We would we would be able to make a soft commitment before necessarily having all of that desired due diligence, and we would then be able to proceed down that due diligence track. Um, there is a very accelerated timeline from the award to closing. So what we're assuming is that the projects we're looking at right now will need to close in four-ish months, four to five months. Um, or really four to five months from the time that they applied. And so you can imagine that during that time, there's due diligence, there's moving that through our approvals process to get the, the loan funding approved, um, and then all of the negotiation over the loan documentation. So it's, it's accelerated. We've got to move quickly. Um, and then the other piece that has really been a challenge, and here I need to make a shout out to um, Allison Wicks, who I think I saw in the room, and Jimmy Aporta at Metro, who've been really great partners in helping us to figure this out because our funding source here is Metro Bond Funds, um, is how to, how to deal with occupied buildings that have existing tenants that might not meet the income requirements that you're putting on the property. So what I will say is that we're still figuring it out. What's the regulatory agreement going to look like? Um, but there, what we're, we're coming from a strong desire of not wanting to displace existing tenants, and that's the commitment we're starting from. And um, with that, I will pass it to Martin. Well, thank you, Danielle. Uh, my name is Martin Lung. I'm the Director for Acquisitions and Development at Bridge. Um, for those who are not familiar, Bridge is a nonprofit. We've been around since 1983. And I think for the last 41 years of our life, you know, we've always been in our DNA and always will be as a developer, like many of you in the room. Um, so I think when it comes to acquisitions, it's almost like a totally different mindset, totally different time frame, right? Instead of doing things on a 36 month basis, you're talking about 36 days maybe, um, if you're lucky. Um, so I think, you know, for many organizations who might be looking into this, including many of us here on this panel, um, we're used to working on new construction timelines and acquisitions simply remind, requires a different type of culture, internal rules in your organization. And I can touch a little bit on how we've been able to do that, you know, as a developer, but also um, kind of transforming acquisitions from a quote unquote side hustle, if you will, into, you know, a key part of what we do here at Bridge. Um, there's 400 of us and including 60 of us here in Oregon um, across five different teams. Um, so there's basically three strategies um, that we focus on here at Bridge. Um, the first one is acquisitions and conversions of naturally affordable housing, um, market rate housing, um, and then also preservation of the at-risk properties that might have expiring, ex expiring um, regulatory agreements. Um, so it's a little bit, um, today I think the panel is really focused on acquisition of new construction projects. Um, so I will say that, you know, Bridge is very familiar to kind of 
one end of the spectrum, right? New construction. We're also very familiar with the other end of the spectrum, which is kind of peer acquisitions. And we're just like everybody else in this panel, you know, dipping our toes into the acquisition of new construction. Um, so we're all learning this together um, and we're, you know, figuring out a lot in the process. And I do want to applaud OHCS and PHB for being so proactive in kind of reacting to the market and thinking about this and being innovative about it. Because I think, like Daniel mentioned, right, a typical NOFA, you know, will be a months long process and they're doing an over the counter process for the first time. Um, so, big kudos to everybody on this panel. And I'll probably pass it on to Nikolai next because he probably has other things that he can add. Um, but just before I pass it on, uh, this is, I'm not going to touch on everything in this toolbox, but um, in the last four years, this is what we've learned, and we're happy to share as much of it as possible because we want as many folks in the room to be doing this work as well because um, there's more work <laughs> than there are people. Um, so um, kind of the three big buckets of tools that we have in our toolbox at Bridge is, um, you know, one, our access to the property tax exemption and partnering with folks like PHP and local jurisdictions, cities and counties on the property tax exemption. Um, we were very fortunate as a relatively large um, organization to be able to get an S&P rating and we issued our first ESG bonds uh, three years ago and that gives us some working capital to be able to invest um, into the properties. Um, we're also in the process of raising a fund um, to scale this up even further. Um, but across kind of all three buckets you see here, I think the key really here is our partnership with public partners like PHP, like OHCS. Because um, I think you know, bucket one, sustainable cash flow, that's kind of like the foundational um, tools that we need for kind of bucket two and bucket three to work. Um, the second and third group of tools, they're very useful, but we really can't do it without the first group of tools. And the tools that are available to us in each jurisdiction and each county um, really dictates and ultimately decides you know, what level of affordability we can execute and preserve. Um, so in one instance, we might be able to convert and preserve everything at 60% you know, AMI below or 30% or even 50% AMI or below. In other uh, instances where funding might be more limited, we might only be able to do 50-50. Um, you know, so we might be acquiring a property that is 100% market rate currently, but we can convert 50% of it over to affordable. But if there are more tools available to us, we might be able to convert 100%. Um, so looking forward to hearing from our other panelists today, and I'll pass it on to Nikolai. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Nikolai Erson. I'm an affordable housing developer at Home Forward, um, pitch hitting for um, our development director, Jonathan Trutt, who couldn't be here because he's on vacation. I saw in the, in the, um, the, the flyer, the, the, the guidebook, that I was labeled a development director, so I'm going to let him know that I got a promotion, <clears throat> and I should uh, be getting a raise pretty soon. So, yeah. so um for those of you who aren't familiar with Home Forward, we're a public housing agency, public housing authority for um, Portland and great, greater Multnomah County. Uh, we're a public agency that's led by a nine member board of commissioners appointed by the city of Portland, uh, Gresham and Multnomah County. And so we're accountable to the public for fulfilling our mission to uh, de deliver housing and provide vouchers. Uh, we own and operate nearly 7,000 units in the county and serve over 25,000 residents through our properties and through rental subsidies. So every three years we do a strategic planning um, plan and um, shown here is uh, one where we um, had a 2024 goal to acquire two market rate buildings and convert to affordable housing. And we currently have two under contract and are conducting our due diligence investigations right now. And then depending on how this goes, our 2025 goal is to continue acquiring market rate properties, phasing in rent and income restrictions with the ultimate goal of adding 300 homes to our affordable housing portfolio. So that's what we're aiming to do. And the goal was developed following a lot of outreach from the broker community, as Danelle was mentioning, who are interested in selling apartments that are almost on the verge of becoming distressed. 
you know, loans were underwritten when interest rates were low. Uh, rents were underwritten when rents were looking to be uh, much higher. And compar comparable sales, um, you know, were showing that they were going to get returns that these developers aren't getting. And so they're looking for uh, ways to unload their properties and sometimes uh, putting up them up for sale at really amazing prices. Um, in the case of one of these projects, the owner had a variable loan that um, was an interest-only payment for a number of years after it stabilized, and now it's ramping up to being fully amor amortized and is requiring debt service that leaves no remaining cash flow, and then they've got vacancies that are compounding their income problems, and so they're kind of hurting and looking for a way out. So we, um, as I said, got uh, two did, did a bunch of tours, um, saw a whole bunch of different properties uh, through this uh, process and came to put two under contract. I could talk a little bit more about them. Uh, one is near uh, Cesar Chavez Boulevard. Uh, it just opened last year. It's a four-story building um, without an elevator. So we we're hoping to acquire and convert it to an 100% PSH building that's focusing on homeless youth. Uh, figuring that that population could probably deal with not having an elevator a little bit better. Um, there are a number of features in the building that help for PSH. It's uh, a, a, a property that has a single point of entry into the building. There's no retail or anything on the ground floor. Uh, it's There's a lot of durable materials in the units, like solid surface counters and LVT flooring. There's already a community space. A community room with an adjoining um, bathroom. There's a game room that we'll probably repurpose uh, for for a rental office. I'm sorry, for a um, resident services office and a case management office. There's also an exercise room that we're not sure exactly what we're going to deal with, but we'll survey residents as they move in to see how we could program it to fit their needs. Um, and then also in the units, they have through wall AC ports, so we can easily hook up AC when the time comes. And then there's floor drains in all of the bathrooms. So a lot of elements that really lend itself to being a PSH property. Um, some challenges that we're finding, though, is um, it's because it's only 47 units um, and it's 100% PSH, we recognize that we'll probably need 24-hour coverage, uh, somebody to be on site at that whole time. Uh, however, because it's 47 units, the payment rate from the Joint Office of Homeless Services might not be sufficient to provide funding to allow for 24-hour coverage. And so we're looking at other ways in which we can meet that through housing vouchers. There's a foster youth vouchers that we're looking to bring in that can pro provide a little bit more income and hopefully help uh, enable us to meet those staffing needs. Uh, another thing that's interesting is there's no common laundry facility. The, this property has in-unit laundry and just, you know, our, our history with uh, laundry, I think that will probably become an issue for maintenance. And so we might remove those laundry units and build out a laundry facility on the ground floor. Uh, there's some other upgrades that we need, including security cameras and, um, you know, office spaces, as I mentioned, some maintenance improvements, and then trauma-informed design because it's all you know, white walls, and we'll probably need to introduce some color and soften up the place a bit. Um, other challenges we're dealing with is we're on a four-month uh, time frame from the, the moment we signed our contract to closing, and so we have to work with our public funders to get the money together so we can actually acquire this building. And then, obviously, we also have relocation, and I think we'll talk more about that in the question and answer session, so I'll leave it there. Another property we're looking at is in the Goose Hall neighborhood. It's uh, just six years old, located near uh, Lincoln High School in a super walkable, amenity-rich area. <clears throat> the population we'd likely serve here would be workforce housing with rent set at 50% AMI. Uh, this building has features that also lend itself to affordable housing, including trauma-informed design. There's some transparency in the public spaces that you know, make, allow people to see what they're, what they're coming into when they come walk walk into the um, community room. That also has uh, LVT and sol solid surface counters in the units. It's got vented range hoods, ample bike parking, and a and decent common area. Um, it's challenged because there isn't a bathroom on the ground floor or um, a dedicated office space, so we'll likely take one unit offline. So it's a 61-unit project that will turn into a 60-unit building. And then um, relocation will also be a challenge, though I think at this property there will be a number of people who meet the income, restrict 
income requirements and we'll be able to stay in place. So yeah, that's what we're working on and um, looking forward to um, seeing how, how we can partner with our funders on these acquisitions. Thank you. Well, there you have it, easy. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Um, so we have some questions that we can explore with them, uh, some questions for the funders, the state and PHP, as well as with the developers. And, and again, um, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to ask, uh, to add more questions. But I guess we can we can start with some easy questions about, and for, for our partner developers about, I mean, you've, you've began uh, sharing how in the process that you take in making a decision, we'll go this route. So if you could expand a little bit more what considerations you take or think about uh, going into market acquisition or acquisition as opposed to uh, new construction or another kind of or another kind of uh, preservation uh, project, for example. Uh, each each of you, of course, uh, have, have to, you have your own organizations and the complexity of it. But for any other partner developer here, what else would you add uh, if they wanted to consider and do a market acquisition? Or, or Nikolai? You're, I'm, just to clarify the question, you asked what advice we'd give to, 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 excuse me, to developers who are looking to do market acquisitions? No, how, how, how does going forward, for example, for example, makes a determination, we're going to go and look at these gotcha. acquisitions. Okay. So I think that we're kind of building the plane as we're flying it right now. Um, this is um, this is a new a new way of doing things. Um, so we're we're really trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. Um, as I mentioned, we've been approached by a number of brokers and toured a whole bunch of different buildings. Some of these seem too big, um, you know, 150, 200 units seemed a lot to put um, a lot of risk to take on. Through an acquisition, um, also a big that would be a big concentration of of units that um, would have affordability restrictions. Some of them had a lot of non rentable space and different amenities that we couldn't really see maintaining. You know, there was there was a, a project that had a whole bunch of um, storage units that they rented to market rate tenants, and that made sense for them. Underground parking, pickleball court. You know, there was a lot of different things that. We don't really see an affordable housing that just didn't make sense for us to to um, convert. So we also put a, a project under contract that we ended up walking away from because it, there were a lot of um, uh, risks that were more difficult for us to manage. Like it had really strong retail space, and Home Forward isn't really good managing retail space. And so I think that walking away from that deal was probably a good thing. Generally, though, um, you know, we I think when we do put, put something on our contract, we have to do thorough inspections, make sure that the project was built with the durability that we, we need. In a, you know, we we use great general contractors and trust that they're going to pro pro produce a, a good project and walking into a project that's finished and, you know, making sure that it's it was constructed well. So, you know, we're, we're doing window testing, we're looking at sewer scopes, things like that. Um, have to do a review of financials and see what kind of maintenance uh, the project has needed over the years since it's been operating. And then also making sure that it's suitable to the population that we intend to serve, that the location that it's in is desirable. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the rentable space versus the community space and, and how those can fit for the intended population we're aiming to serve. So that's kind of our game plan, I think, right now. Yeah, I think we're in a very similar position as Home Forward. You know, we're also learning a lot as we go, and we started this journey um, probably four or five years ago as Bridge, because we've always been a developer, and we operate on developer timelines. <laughs> and I think, you know, when you're out in the market, um, in the acquisition space, um, you're competing against firms and companies and for profits mostly um, that just does this as their day job, right? 100% of the time. They don't do new construction. They've got a whole machine 
you know, I'm raising my 11th fund for acquisitions. <laughs> I was talking to another friend uh, last week and, you know, she's doing her 11th fund. They have a really robust track record and they have a machine that's set up, you know, between the development team, the asset management team, the property management team, they're vertically integrated. So this is kind of the landscape, right? That Bridge and other nonprofits and including Home Forward and housing authorities that we're competing against from around the market trying to buy properties. Um, we are trying to react and move fast at a different timeline. And I think, um, back to Roberto's original question, um, before we kind of jump into the deep end of the pool, we've got to ask ourselves as an organization, you know, what do we want to get out of the acquisition program? Um, is this something that we want to do opportunistically? You know, we might do a couple, maybe even one or two a year. Um, or is this like a whole new line of business that strategically that we want to grow? And I think for Bridge, you know, we did a lot of inward, you know, looking and kind of navel gazing, if you will, as part of our strategic planning process. And we realized that, um, as other panelists mentioned earlier, um, it's costing us almost 500K a door for new construction. And we can buy stuff for less than 200K a unit. Um, and even for brand new stuff that's on the market, that's unoccupied, doesn't have existing tenants, that might be getting a permit, a TCO soon, those are costing you know, in the mid 300s. So substantially less money, requires less subsidy, delivers affordable housing way faster. The housing crisis is happening today. It can't wait three years while we cobble together funding um, and go through the permitting process and build it. Um, so we decided as an organization strategically that Yes, we're not going to do this, you know, as a one or two projects a year thing. We're going to try and do this as a 50-50. We're going to shift from our previous mix of, you know, 90-10, 90% new construction, 10% acquisitions, into more consciously and intentionally a 50-50 strategy just because of what we're seeing in the market. And, of course, if the market changes in two or three years, which it will, um, we might, you know, have a new strategic plan, a new different direction. But I think for now, that's what we decided was right for our organization and we've intentionally, you know, try to orient, reorient our kind of staff capacity internally and our financial capacity internally to support that growth. So every week, and I think Ivy's in the room right now. <laughs> She's our asset manager here in Oregon. Um, and Noah's here as well from a development team. You know, we have um, weekly meetings where we talk about the new projects that are coming through the acquisitions pipeline. Um, which is pretty intensive because Ivy has a day job, right? Everybody in asset management has a day job. Everybody in development team, our development team has a day job. So we've tried to, and we're still in the process of doing it, but trying to reorient our internal processes and internal culture to make sure that if we need to meet a 30 day or maybe if we're lucky 45 day due diligence timeline, that we have the right resources. We don't overstretch people internally. And if we don't have the resources internally, how do we find external resources and consultants um, or other team members from other offices of Bridge that could help support us? Um, or hire the right people who have that experience, maybe from a for-profit firm that have done this before, that can bring kind of their expertise and help us build that capacity internally. So I think, you know, one, you gotta ask yourself organizationally, you know, what is the goal of establishing an acquisition program? And two, trying to align the staff and financial capacity around that larger, bigger picture goal. Thank you. So maybe just a show of hands. So who else in the room is thinking about market acquisition? Yeah, there's there's a few. And do you are you seeing probably, I mean, there are properties available? Okay. So to that, then um, I guess for, for um, Nikolai or, or, and Martin, so what, what advice would you give them? Go into it, don't go into it, or because, <laughs> I mean, Portland is different than, than other communities, but um, because I, I think, yeah, it's, it's a major undertaking and certainly in some cases a totally new one. So any ad additional tips or advice that you would give your, your colleagues? First, I would say it's a lot of work. Um, 
it, it's not, you'd think that it'd be easy, um, easier than new construction, but it's still a lot of work. Um, I think that we spend a lot of time uh, answering questions of, from funders, and that seems to be taking up most of my day these days. Um, so, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. There's more where that came from. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing I would say is to do whatever you can to negotiate a long due diligence period with the seller. Um, anytime you can extend that timeline is going to be time that um, will be put to use. I think it's it's it, it's too condensed. You know, a four month period is too condensed to get everything done that you need to get done. So um, I wish that we had more than four months. And so we'll see what happens as, as we continue along. And then um, given given what Garrick was saying about the lift funding, it's going to be necessary to figure out some sort of bridge financing um, because you're going to have to um, purchase, a, you know, expend, spend a lot of money buying a building that you're not going to get any public funding for for a very long time as you convert, convert it, move people out, and um, get qualified people in. So there's going to be a, a lot of um, time that you're going to have to use either your own resources or some kind of acquisition or bridge loan product. And that just makes everything a little bit more expensive. So that's the advice I would say. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that, but I think um, kind of back to the original comment I made, right? Like figure out if it's right for your organization, if it's something that you want to do. Um, and then either say, you know, no, this is not something that is right for my organization, or if you say yes, right, um, you really got to wholeheartedly commit to it because it is not kind of a half-hearted thing. I think for a long time, uh, Bridge as an organization, um, we did it as a kind of side gig, if you will, um, and we've learned a lot of lessons the hard way um, because of that, um, and you always learn something new in the middle of acquisitions. <laughs> um, you know, there's always a random problem that pops up, you know, either in the middle of due diligence, hopefully, but sometimes it's post-closing once you come into ownership um, that you learn new things about the property once you actually come into ownership and try to run it. Um, so I think um, having uh, and hiring people who have done this before or, you know, finding folks um, in the nonprofit community and peers that have done it before um, and maybe JVing if it's like your first deal, I think that could be really tremendously helpful. Um, and I think you know there's a, probably a role for you know organizations like NOAA or Housing Oregon. Um, I know Rob Prash used to run the working group right for folks that are in the preservation space. So I think having more groups like that where folks like us, me and Nikolai, can exchange ideas and learn from each other, um, I think that could be really helpful. And help our respective organizations figure out if this is the right thing or not. Um, but at least for Bridge, you know, we made that decision internally that it does make sense for us and we hope to do more of it. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say if the funders also had some advice to uh, uh, for, um, for potential buyers of market rate housing. Uh, is it related to Okay, yeah, well, we'll we'll pass the mic around. When, thank you. Um, so for for us, I mean, the the market rate acquisition in and using lift resources, it's it's new, it's brand new, and I think it's the same thing for PHB, and so it's only been a been a few months under our belt in trying to make this work. So I'm wondering if uh, from the development side, the developer side, where we are now. What else or how else could we, could we do this better? Meaning we, the state, uh, or in this case, uh, maybe PHB. And I don't know if in the room there are any jurisdictions wanting to get into the arena of funding as well. A Salem, city of Salem, Jessica? <laughs> okay, all right. But ju anyway, just curious, uh, anyway, uh, as we keep, uh, um, improving and that's that's part of the path that we're on making the work the orca work uh, as efficiently as we can so at this uh, point in time i don't know if 
any suggestions for us, the funders, how we could do this better or differently? I love this question. <laughs> Good job. I have thoughts. <laughs> I think the, the thing I like least about my job is working on funding applications, and I find that I'm doing it more and more. Um, and um, so I, I th I've got a, a few things to, to say. Um, one, I would just implore public funders to keep things simple and simplify the process. I think oftentimes uh, questions are asked and we have to answer them and those answers take a really long time to produce and I don't know um, that they need all that information and I don't know where it goes all the time. So I think that... <laughs> Into secret spots. Into secret spots. <laughs> I'm sure. But but seriously, like you know, there's other sessions probably in this in this conference about capacity building, and it's a capacity building thing. You know, every question that we we have to answer and spend time on is is time that we could be spending building partnerships with community based organizations, looking into ways that we could um, do um, energy efficiency upgrades. You know, all those things take take capacity, and so. I, fi I find that more of my time is being spent um, dealing with funding questions. So that's one. The second thing would be uh, to speed up the process. Um, you know, the ORCA, for example, is built thinking about new construction, and those have time frames that are three to four years. And we're talking about three to four months. And um, it's, it's going to be a challenge to do acquisitions in this time when, you know, all of these opportunities are available for us to increase the inventory of affordable housing. And until that process speeds up, I don't think that, I think we're gonna watch a lot of these opportunities pass us by. And finally, I think that it'd be great if OHGS could figure out a way to get the funding in at closing versus as these units come online, because um, there's, you know, Home Board has a, a deep balance sheet. We're lucky in that way. We also have a line of credit that we can use to kind of bridge that, that the funding. And a lot of these smaller organizations that might want to be doing acquisitions aren't going to be able to, to come up with that. And so those are those are people who could have the capacity to bring a lot of units into the affordable housing uh, portfolio, and they're not going to be able to because of that rule. So those are my three ideas, and um. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll, I'll echo idea number one. Um, and I, I will say that with the new process that has come out with ORCA, um, as well as this NOFA, I think it's become more easy to predict, right? Like, I say, not 100%. You don't know for sure if you're going to get funded. Never. But um, at least, you know, it's an over-the-counter process. And um, the acquisitions kind of move on their own timeline. They don't care about when an RFP comes out. They don't care when a NOFA comes out. And opportunities always come up at the most inconvenient moment, right, when a, maybe a public funder has committed all of their funding already to other projects. So then, you know, oftentimes, you know, sponsors and developers like us, you know, then we're left to say, oh, do we do this out of our own balance sheet? And if so, you know, how many of these could we really do on our own balance sheet? not too many um and we're trying to correct that and change that here at bridge um but uh i'm a glutton for punishment so i love funding applications it's where i spend most of my life uh, <laughs> uh but there are definitely certain other places where i could spend my time um um i guess back to the i guess more advice for funders and i'm I actually do want to pass it on to danielle because i'm curious what it looks like from the funders perspective too when we submit something, you know, what are you looking for? What do you see that we might be answering or perhaps we're not answering? Because um, I think, like Nikolai said, you know, we try to be as detailed as possible. But sometimes, um, you know, we can't get all 10 third-party reports done within a 30-day timeline. Uh, we try to. Maybe we'll get like seven or eight done. Um, and then... We try to extend the due diligence, due diligence contingency as much as possible, but we got to be able to stay competitive in the market. And sometimes, you know, Bridge is put in a position, um, and we're fortunate to be able to be in that position, and many smaller organizations can't. And I wish they could, because there's so much of this work that needs to be done, and we need more people doing it. 
um, where we're put in a position where we don't know if we're going to get funding. Um, we don't know if we're going to get um, consent from OHCS or other folks that have Allura, um, whether they'll you know, give us a formal consent, even though we think they will. Um, and we expect them to. <laughs> and we haven't failed to get consent. Um, but there is a lot of risk. And we are maybe by day 30, we're waiving due diligence and going non-refundable on a $1 million deposit. And we're fortunate enough as our organization to be able to take that risk and say, yes, we believe things will turn out OK based on the feedback you know, informally or formally that we've heard from our public partners. Um, but to the degree that our public partners are able to provide kind of formal feedback at a faster pace, perhaps through ORCA or through this new process that PHB has rolled out, that gives me and Nikolai way more confidence that we are able to release our deposit. Because um, even for an organization the size of Home Forward and for Bridge, a you know, million dollars is a lot of money, no matter how you look at it. Um, well, now I feel a little defensive about our about our application. No, <laughs> no um, okay, so to answer your question about, well, I think there are two questions there. What are we looking for in an application? And then this idea of giving you a nod, yes or no, kind of early on so you can move forward with that due diligence before the deposit becomes non-refundable. Um, on the first point, I think you know a lot of P what PHB is looking for is rooted in equity, and so we are asking a lot of the same questions that we would on new construction projects, which is how does this project serve the target population that you've identified? What are the services and programming that you see as part of this? Do you have any identified partnerships? Um, I, th I think we do recognize that you know it's it's difficult on the timeline we're moving to maybe get those MOUs with the nonprofit you know service partners. Um, but we want to hear what your what your plan is, um, and um, we oh, I think a piece that might be different is around community engagement. Actually, so normally with a new construction project, we expect there to have been pretty robust um, engagement uh, with the sort of target population prior to the proposal coming in. Here we recognize that you you haven't you know this is in some ways opportunistic. You've identified this property, and so our questions about engagement are more around. You know, what past engagement have you done that kind of informed your approach to thinking about services at the property? Or what future engagement might you do now that the property is identified? Those kinds of things. Um, and then on, on your point about, um, I, I think that what was, I was referring to earlier is our soft commitment. I think that's kind of what you're looking for, is being able to give a soft commitment early on, um, maybe before we have all that due diligence in. Uh, I will say through our RFP, we've asked for, you know, if there are reports that maybe they're not uh, a brand new capital needs assessment, but maybe you have something from the seller that they've been willing to provide that's a couple years old that can at least give us some idea, or a um, phase one from a few years ago, that type of thing. Um, so we would still, through the due diligence process, expect there to be updates to those reports, but as kind of part of our process of, of being able to give that soft commitment, we're willing to look at those reports that might be a few years old, for example. Anything you want to add on? Yeah. A few things that I want to add, though, too, is I tried to allude to it uh, in the beginning of, of uh, my presentation, is that Lyft in itself, I've, I've been struggling the entire day to think of a different word other than wonky. But wonky is the only word that I can think of. Um, and a developer friend said, just say wonky. We all know it's wonky. Like, it's, it's OK. Um, but it. What I, what I mean by that is that it, based on how it's originated, it has just like, I, the only analogy I can think of is federal funds. It's a very this, not this. You can do this, but you can't do this from how it's originated. It, we're using it in the aspect of opportunity, to, to sort of address an opportunity, but also recognizing that you know, we, we don't have a, a track just for acquisition yet. So like we have to use our existing thing, which is the ORCA process. And you are absolutely correct. Like it's a new construction or it's a, you know, like it, it's one of those processes. Um, and we're, so, and what, what funders are looking for are alignment of a lot of criteria. And I, we know that certain organizations have that, but we still want to see what you've done and what understand that aspect of it. But also, like, we are internalizing, like, 
all right, how does this project build to a 30 year standard? Are we, you know, what are those things that the key information that helps us, are you gonna come back in five years for more money after you get like everyone sort of meets that criteria? So we have to think about just like as you're evaluating projects, like whether that's a, whether that makes good financial sense and, and just whether it makes sense to like best, not that we, sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> how do you handle those awkward moments of silence in front of a room full of strangers? Hi. Um, so, and I think that that's the, you know, in lieu of not having a different process, it's we have to still check that box and we still have to see that and we have to evaluate that report. And then we have to go into your phase two, then, then look if there was a LUST and, you know, it's just sort of like, okay, so is that okay or is that not okay? Is that, you know, so it's, you know, and just like it, it takes time to provide that information. It takes time to review that information too. Um, we are cognizant of timelines and we are trying hard to meet those. And it's also a new process for us. So I love your analogy of like putting the plane together as we're flying. We are doing the same thing and recognizing that not all of these pieces fit together well, but we're trying. And I would also say that we are also open to hearing your things about like, this was awesome and this wasn't. Right, like this did not work at all. So, and then hearing that, and like, okay, like, what what does that mean for future conversations? Is it is Lyft stay as an acquisition? Is it something else? Right, like, if if that opportunity stays for a longer period of time, and it's it's more than an opportunity, and this becomes a norm, we're going to need some other source to, to sort of actually dedicate to that. Um, I'll risk you. I would. <laughs> Uh, um, so the, the um, um, what was I going to ask? So some, well, as uh, as in the RFP or as in the ORCA, we've got some thresholds, some standards that we have to meet. And I mean, it's it's not a justification for a lot of things that we put in application, but we too have to respond to a body of sixty some people. So where's the money going? How are you putting the money out? This is affordable housing. So, but we are, again, we're open to how we can make this better. Um, I, I wonder from PHB and then uh, Garrick and then the work that we've been doing now, are there some requirements in this acquisition of market rate housing that we need to have? Like, th like these, are, these are a must? Um, because I think that there are some opportunities that where we could be probably be more flexible. But I'm just curious about, I mean, we're talking about affordable housing that, um, that have to have some kind of uniqueness in, in a way. And that probably comes from the funding. So uh, is anything that comes to mind like saying, this we cannot let go, meaning we need to have this. And maybe some other things that we say, well, we could, we could do something different about this. Um, so I, I'm going to answer the question a little differently, which is, <laughs> so the question that I was, was thinking of was sort of like, how does, as a public funder, how do you think about developing a solicitation, which I think maybe we'll get to some of that, but um, so some of the things that come to mind are what, what's your source of funding? Are you putting federal funds out there? Are you putting vouchers out? If yes, think about how can you fit the timing of a HUD environmental review into this very condensed process. Um, maybe put the vouchers in after acquisition, if, you're, if that's what you're doing. Um, if it's federal funding, the Uniform Relocation Act is triggered. And so that's another level of um, relocation assistance that if you're doing an occupied building, you'll have to take into consideration. In our case, we were fortunate to be using Metro bond funds and we actually decided not to uh, put vouchers in as part of the solicitation, so, but some considerations there. How can you, I think we've kind of covered this, but how can you move a little bit more nimbly maybe than um, the typical public solicitation process? And in our case, we decided to do this kind of new for us rolling basis, um, accepting on a rolling basis, reviewing on a rolling basis. Um, and as I mentioned, being able to make a soft commitment um, a little earlier on than we perhaps normally would. 
uh, given that it's different from new construction, how will you size your maximum subsidy per unit? So in our case, we were thinking about a very simplified capital stack that included probably perm debt, lift funds, and PHB as gap. Uh, so what we actually modeled um, perm debt and the max lift subsidy per unit, which is, varies by unit size, and sort of came up with a number that we thought would be appropriate and would help to make these projects pencil. Um, what will you allow for a developer fee? So this is very, it's different than new construction, right? And it actually doesn't fit neatly into the acquisition rehab um, type of project, which is usually a very substantial rehab. Um, and so our, our existing developer fee limits are kind of organized around those two types of projects. And it, this, this is kind of something new. So I actually really like in the lift manual, it, you, have, you kind of came up with your own 5% of the total um, project cost. I think we're going to actually roll with that because I like that best, the best. Um, but what will you charge for a developer fee? Or what will you allow for a developer fee? Um, because as Nikolai mentioned, these are still a lot of work for the developers. Um, how can you uh, oh, include a site visit as part of your review, even if you're on that accelerated time timeline? There's really no substitute for going into the building and seeing it for yourself. You know, can we've, we're doing that with all of the projects that are coming in through the RFP. We're bringing some underwriters and construction coordinators out to actually see the building. And that um, really gives you just so much information. Do you have, can you, um, you know, build within your network a few brokers that can help you sort of like ground truth information as you're putting together your solicitation. So one of the things I was concerned about was we want to identify projects that can close in 2025 because our closing timeline is totally bonkers through the end of the year and I, we just could not take on any more projects. And so one of the questions I had for a broker was, do you think there are sellers out there who are willing to you know, have that long of a timeline before closing? And the message I heard was actually, yeah, and that it's kind of part of this unique window of time that like sellers are being more accommodating. So we, we think that could work. And so that was really helpful for me. The only thing that I would add to that is that um, just speaking specifically about Lyft, um, Lyft is, can, can only pay for certain things. So timing was one thing that was brought up, right? So of just, I, I guess where I'm going with this is knowing the limitations of the subsidy or the source that you're using. If, if that is the source or a part of the sources, it's, you know, what are the things that you're going to have to defer to to sort of make that work? And all developers sort of play that game about like, oh, most restrictive, we got to do this or play with this thing. It has to, like, we have to defer to that. Um, the one thing when I heard this question that I instantly thought of specifically for this opportunity is occupied units. People are going to be living in the units. Relocation is going to be a big part of that. And knowing the source, a big thing about Lyft is that is not an eligible use of funding. And so just as you're thinking about the, the types of sources that you're using that will make this work or make the timing work of those things, it, it, it really is um, seeing if, and, and maybe that goes into that quick, in, that analysis of your organization is like, is this right for our organization to do this? You know, can these sources align to sort of this will work for this and that will work for that and these things can come together and all of that will make that happen. I mean, it you know, it just I think about like cash flow too on a spreadsheet too of sort of making you put all those things together and think about that. Like can can it actually make that work when I need it to actually work? Um, and I know it's a lot to ask, it's a lot to do, but also I think that um that um I, I specifically remember um, this is, it's not the same situation, but working, there was a time during COVID when investors were going after manufactured home parks. Um, and so they're throwing liquid money with crazy terms, terms that I've ne never seen before and going hard with $100,000 or $200,000 or $500,000 depending upon the park, waving all these things, closing with like, crazy time frames of having to make an acquisition decision and having like 30 or 45 days to do so right and, and and focusing that about what is your priorities and 
should we actually make this work and can we make it work? Like it's a very, it's a hard, quick analysis, right? And that opportunity is here too for a different purpose, but like it's that same analysis, right? And, and, and if, those, if, <laughs> if those things align, then like, you know, there's a path. And I think that what, what I'm hoping also comes out of this process is like, here are some things that'll really make this better. Um, and so, um, I don't know why I say so, <laughs> as though I'm passing it, but it's just a tick. Uh, that's all right. Um, but before we open up for questions, uh, any any other thoughts or from development partners or funders? Okay. But but we um, so there was a question early on. Are you ready? We have sorry. We have to use the mic. There is folks on uh, doing virtual. Uh, yeah, we sort of. My original question was going to be, what are the questions that lenders are asking that are taking up so much of your time, Nikolai? Um, <laughs> and we covered a lot of that, and I'm familiar. But what? So question one is, um, what? Um, what other questions, what kind of underwriting questions are lenders asking about these projects that may be different from a new construction or a standard rehab? Give you some few seconds to think about that. Um, I guess there's a different checklist right between public funders and lenders. Um, are, are asking about the which one? Renders? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it's... Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, I think it's a pretty standardized checklist at this point, right? It's like you go through your physical uh, needs assessment, your PCA, um, and then, you know, we always get a contractor actually price it out because we don't trust the PCA's estimates, of course. Um, and then we also, you know, do 100% unit walks. We do, you know, pest inspections, phase one, hopefully not phase two. Um, and then um, I can go on and on. There's, you know, 15 different reports that we always run, you know, zoning, seismic. Some of these are like kind of check the box kind of items. Um, but a lot of these are, you know, material, mostly the PCA and trying to refine the scope of work um, and whether, you know, we need to do like a major capex once we acquire the property. Let's say it's like a 1960s property or 70s property where you still have 1960s electrical and plumbing. Um, or um, we've been lucky to also buy some properties that are like, you know, 2014, 10 years old, basically turnkey, which has been really great for us. Um, so depending on where on the spectrum, I think that's really the biggest pivot point for us and really um, informs our budget going forward, post-closing, and also whether we need to pursue public funding to fill some of that gap. Yeah, I think on, on the projects that we're working on, it might be a little bit different because we're trying to avoid taking out any sort of loan on the projects, um, trying to avoid an acquisition loan, particularly for the one that is a PSH property because you know we're, we're actively working with a broker to not lease up um, vacant units right now. And um, so it's, you know, to approach an acquisition, um, to approach like an acquisition lender, you know, they're looking at the income and we're, we're showing a building that is sinking, right? So it's a bit different and the ability to get an acquisition loan becomes a little bit more challenging because of that. So. As a lender, uh, I think the one thing that's sort of outside of the norm of an acquisition that we'd be looking at is just the retenanting and the lease up. Is there anything that you can touch on regarding the retenanting and lease up portion of these, how you're looking at that? I've got to count my steps now. <laughs> Yeah, and you know we haven't talked really about relocation yet either, and I think that's kind of an important element um, for for the PSH property. Um, actually, for well, I'll start with the PSH property on on the relocation side. Um, this is the plan right now, and and it might change depending on 
on feedback and stuff like that we receive. Um, but what we're aiming to do is once we close on the purchase, we would notify tenants that it's going to be uh, converted into a PSH property and allow folks to break their leases if they have them, offer Portland's mandatory relocation assistance, but um, times one and a half. So we'll, we'll be basically issuing checks of around $5,000 to each of the tenants um, if they are able to uh, move. And nobody would be evicted um, because, um, you know, but we would imagine that folks would um, self-select and would want to move out um, knowing how the property is going to be used. Um, and then for the Goose Hollow prop property, we would um, hopefully qualify a lot of tenants that are living there already because, um, you know, we'd expect that there are probably a lot of folks there who would meet the income restrictions and wouldn't have to move and would benefit from cheaper rents and so would, would opt into sharing their, their income and qualifying for uh, an affordable housing apartment. And then also doing the same sort of thing with Portland's mandatory relocation assistance program times one and a half. So that's our aim for, for kind of emptying the buildings. Um, and then for the PSH building, leasing it up, we have to go through the, um, the uh, uh, Portland's, um, what's the, yeah, through the joint office and through their process of filling the building with, um, with formerly homeless youth. And for the Goose Hollow project, I think we would market it as an affordable housing building and try to fill it with qualified tenants as just, just as if it was a tax credit project. So that's the plan. If you have thoughts, I'd love to hear you. I think for us at the bridge, I'm gonna scroll back up to this slide. It really depends on what strategy we're executing. You know, sometimes in a perfect world, right, you're buying a building that's at risk and you're preserving it. So all the tenants qualify and everybody stays. Um, and other times, you know, we're buying market rate buildings. Um, so like Nikolai mentioned, you know, we don't try to displace anyone. Um, if you like where you're living, you can stay and we want you to stay. Um, but over time, right, just natural turnover. You know, some buildings might turn over 10% a year. Other times, uh, in some market rate buildings, we've seen turnover as high as 50%. Um, so there's just like the natural um, turnover, and that could also inform what strategy we're trying to execute, right? So in those instances, you know, we might say, oh, we're going to convert this to 100% affordable over time, over three years, or it might take us six years, um, or in a market that's very tight and people think they have a really great deal and they don't want to move, you know, we might have a different business plan that says we're going to do 50-50 and keep the other 50% as market rate because we don't think people are going to want to relocate. So it just depends on the plan. Thank you. You, you said you, you're a lender. So back to the lending community, any interest in being part of? Uh, so I'm Ann Ann Rumors. I'm the deputy director at the Network for Oregon Affordable Housing. Not to be confused with NOAA Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. Um, and we do have an acquisition product, and uh, but our challenge, like in the case of uh, Home Forward projects, um, they were too large for our acquisition program, so we just couldn't um, cobble together enough funds for the size of acquisition they were doing. But um, we're definitely, you know, understand the importance of the opportunity that we have at hand and if there are smaller uh, projects that we could finance, we absolutely would and we you know try to figure out ways that we could work through the lease up issues and retenting etc um so yeah we're here but just can't do unfortunately like 12 million dollar acquisitions so if you have a smaller project call me <laughs> <laughs> thank you anybody back here Hi there. Okay, so um, I guess my question is that it seems like from the Home Forward perspective in the Goose Hollow project, there is a need to, you know, qualify tenants at time of close. So there will be some form of like tenant displacement, um, whereas PHB is offering like an RFP, whereas tenant displacement is like explicitly not the goal. And so is there like, if that's incorrect, um, 
I just wanted to know if there was like statutory requirements of like housing authorities that like place them at a disadvantage when sources are like that. Yeah, no, it, at Goose Hollow, there would be no mandatory displacement that would take place. We would notify tenants and let them know that they have the ability to get cheaper rent if they qualify. And um, if they don't, they're welcome to stay. Um, you know, they would stay at market rate rents at that, at that stage. And as people moved out, we would turn it into an affordable unit. And that's sort of the plan there. I'll just add to that, that um, in terms of the RFP, we're again, we're still kind of working through what the regulatory agreement will look like. But um, some of the things we have been thinking about for existing tenants are uh, a required notification timeline so that tenants know what is happening and that there will be the opportunity to income qualify and then being given that opportunity within a certain period of time after closing. So um, they can choose to income certify and try to get um, into a rent restricted unit. If they don't qualify or they don't respond, they would be considered over income. Um, and then I think our assumption is that through some combination of just sort of natural turnover, along with the incentives to relocate, that there's probably many of the existing tenants, you know, there will be turnover within, you know, a few years, I think is our assumption. Um, but there, there's really no, um, yeah, you're correct that there's a strong desire to not displace tenants and to really let people sort of have choices over whether they stay or leave. Um, one thing that we are looking for for any occupied acquisitions is that the organization either has the capacity and, ex and past experience, ideally, to manage um, relocation thoughtfully and to sort of cause the least disruption for our tenants, or if, if not past experience than a, a willingness to, um, you know, hire a relocation consultant to sort of help with that um, process. Back here. Thanks. I got a big picture question. Uh, the the perennial tension between affordable housing and, and fair housing and integration is that if you go to where land is the cheapest, then you can end up really concentrating affordable housing and, and uh, you know, in neighborhoods that might not be high opportunity. Um, is that something that you have to contend with when you're looking at places to uh, potentially acquire? Um, do you think that acquisitions you know, get around that because they are so much cheaper per unit than building new construction. Anyone? Um, I, th I think our hope and one of the sort of preferences that's baked into our RFP is that um, projects will offer significant opportunities based on their location, so access to transit, you know, neighborhood amenities, grocery store services. Um, and I, I do think that this does offer an opportunity to, to sort of get those properties that we, we pro probably would not have an opportunity to build in some of these neighborhoods right now, at least, um, due to the cost of land. So I, th I think it's a win in that regard. Anything to add? Oh, actually, I, I do. Sorry. Uh, going back to also the process for application two, um, we're still evaluating it as we do any other new development of construction. And so we look at the proximity to walkable things in grocery stores and, and how the site is specific to that um, and, and put that through as we would another or a, a development that would go through a, 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 diff, a similar process through the, or through the ORCA. Um, so I know it's time consuming, but it also helps us inform that like, this is a really good opportunity and reinforces that. Thank you. Yeah. I'll ask this as simply as I can, but it's uh, got a lot of facets to it. How do you navigate the property tax exemption on the market rate units? And I, I think the answer is different between Portland and Multnomah County and the and the balance of state, but if anyone can speak to to that, that that's a pretty critical component. 
bridge how how do you kind <laughs> of Yeah, I think unlike California, we don't have a statewide law in Oregon, so it is kind of a jurisdiction by jurisdiction thing. Um, I think as nonprofits, you know, we're able to access it in Washington County. Um, and I'll let Home Forward talk about City of Portland, but City of Portland obviously has it for nonprofits as well. But when you're outside of City of Portland and the rest of Multnomah County, um, we actually have to enter into a partnership with Home Forward because as a public housing authority, they have that ability. Um, so I don't think Clyde wants to speak a little to that. Yeah, I mean, exactly what he said. So Home Forward has the ability to get a tax exemption in in all of Multnomah County, so including Gresham and um, the other cities. Um, so that's what we would end up doing. And for nonprofits that are looking to do the same, then I think that we can enter into a partnership to uh, extend that tax exemption. Um, yeah. Other parts of the state, I'm not sure. It's a little more complicated. <clears throat> For other parts of the state too, you can also, it's not a full exemption if you can't get a partnership with the housing authority, um, the special assessed value as well. So if you get recorded a, a deed restriction on the property, uh, each individual assessor can determine there's a calculation for it, um, but they can actually show that this is not market rate because of the affordability restriction. You can get a special assessed value, which will actually greatly reduce the market value of what you have to pay for it. Um, so Martin or Nicola, what, what would make a, a good project, a good market acquisition project in, in the ideal world, if, if we can dream there, what, yeah, in your mind, what would, what would be a, a good market acquisition project? I mean, I, I think I described a lot of the elements that we look for, um, you know, durable materials, the types of flooring, things like that. Um, the right size is something that we look forward. Um, and then just a seller that understands that this is going to be a more complicated transaction, um, dealing with public funders and the timing and the publicity that might go along with it, um, and the thorough inspections and tours that we'll be taking folks on through throughout the whole process. Um, and then just, I think as Marn was saying about the internal capacity that you have to figure out um, whether you're able to do it or not. Um, one thing that's kind of come to mind, though, not something that I think would be suitable for Home Forward is whether a mixed income project could work um, in an acquisition. I think that could be kind of an interesting um, model because, you know, if you integrate affordability, say, for half the units then um, and, and keep market for the other half, there's no, there's no tax credits that are, are causing you know, the restrictions to be in place. And so I wonder if there's, you know, creative solutions that folks could come up with that um, could take advantage of that. Yeah, and I think that mixed income models worked really well for us because basically it helps us go deeper right on the units that we are able to regulate. Um, and there's more sustainable cash flow, especially if it's like a smaller property. Um, so we try to target um, assets that are 100 plus units um, ideally with, you know, minimum CapEx or rehab, um, unless there's, you know, a lot of foundation money or a lot of public money that's available. Um, generally, it's just difficult, right, for us to take on, you know, a giant, you know, 40,000 a unit, 50,000 a unit rehab. Um, so, and I think to Nikolai's point, you know, um, finding a cooperative and willing seller is also key to it. Um, you know, there's always going to be, you know, somebody, uh, like Garrett mentioned, right, Close super fast, waves contingency, you know, 30 days. Um, and Bridge is able to do that um, for the most part. Um, but there are additional complications of just the fact that we are, you know, trying to convert something into affordable housing or preserve it as affordable housing. So uh, we mostly work with, you know, off market folks that we know already have relationships with. Um, we still do pursue, you know, broker deals that are on the market. Um, but by the time it hits the market, you know, it's usually already too expensive for us. <laughs> and um, we, you know, try to maintain those off-market relationships and make sure that folks know that, you know, if they're in a special situation um, and they want, you know, a smoother, you know, quieter sale without a broker involved, you know, we're there and we're ready to go. Just give us a call. <laughs> well, ben? 
I don't know if uh, OHCS or PHB has thought about this. Um, it seems like if you know if this grows or if this is a, a mechanism that stays in the market for a while, that there would need to be a uh, a messaging around advocacy between the differences between acquisition and continuing the traditional affordable rental housing. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, specifically like the, like a 221D4 product or a federal product. Uh, you can't just use that as a turnkey financing mechanism and sell the property. You've got to stay in the, in the deal for a certain number of years. Uh, acquiring a newly constructed building that uh, was absent MWSB, was absent uh, uh, green building goals, absent uh, uh, the things that, that, you know, that we hold value in, in affordable rental housing development, uh, those questions start to pop up uh, and some advocacy for both this acquisition system and the traditional affordable rental housing seems uh, like, ho hopefully you're working on that. Any thoughts? Or Thank you for that comment. Um, I would just say that from PHB's side, so we're 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 viewing this RFP as kind of a pilot, the, the proof of concept type of thing. We have talked about how we'd be interested in replicating it if if we are successful. Um, but I I do think it's always going to be a very small part of what we do. You know, just. Um, new construction will always sort of be the heart of what our, my team at PHB does. Um, but yeah, to your point, I think it does raise questions about, like you said, the public policy goals that we're able to implement as part of new construction that maybe aren't part of acquisition. We haven't really, I don't really have a good answer on that, but thank you for raising that. I think that's an important point. That became obvious too when we were trying to underwrite some of these things too, that how do you fit this together with all of those different things? And we're struggling, not that we're struggling with it, we're also trying to figure out how to best, like what are the things that really, really matter in those things, given that, and and, it, it, and it's not a, trying to create a trade-off, it's just trying to say that, um, like for an architectural standard, do you create a waiver for something that they're never gonna ever obtain, right? or it's never going to, I'm going to use solar ready. It can never be solar ready or something, right? You know, like what, what do you do with that? But we still want the units because they're going to serve this population, right? And it, those are the things that we're having conversations about, about like, okay, wh what do you do with this? And how do you, how do we approach this individual project? So we're, we're approaching to the end of our session. Any last one, any last question? But 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 it's it's certainly true. The uh, it, it is a unique opportunity, um, and it's the type of properties that probably wouldn't put. Meaning, some of the amenities in these properties we probably wouldn't fund it from a public as a public agency, but they're coming now with this property, and now we're we're going to bring them into the portfolio of affordable housing. There's some trade-offs, but certainly it's some of the policies and goals we have to keep in mind. Um, I mean, we couldn't go back and apply an MWSB policy there. I mean, it's already built. But is there another public purpose that we can expect to come out of this? Uh, and I think what at the core of it is creating affordable housing opportunities uh, for more, more Oregonians. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank uh, Garrick, Daniel, Martin, and Nikolai for, uh, for their sharing their lessons uh, learned with us for your participation, and um, I'll give you the rest of the, whatever, 15, no, 10 more minutes, five more minutes. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for coming and, and joining us. Thank you. <laughs>